Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. You know, it's interesting to be host of a show called The Thinking Atheist, encouraging all within earshot to engage the brain, to reject faith as a way of determining what is true, to always be thinking. Just think about it. If they tell us not to think about that, we should really think about that. We should be thinkers. To be a host of the show, The Thinking Atheist, And to do what I did today, I almost feel like I should resign the show. True story. I'm a coffee addict. Love coffee. Love it. Addicted to it. All those coffee memes you see on Facebook. Yeah, that's me. All right. Go up to the cabinet. No coffee left except for one little bitty bag of coffee, which was purchased in like September of last year. Pumpkin spice flavor. All right, fine. It'll work. It's something. Grab the coffee pot. Clean it out. Grab the filter container. Clean it out. Wash everything. They say the coffee pot is like one of the biggest attractors of germs in any home or office, like more than your toilet seat, right? (laughs) Because most people just rinse it out. So ever since I read that study years ago, I'm meticulous. Scrub it out, get it ready. Pour in the coffee grounds. Go down the hall, figuring I would come back to a nice, fresh pot of coffee. As I walk back in the door, I'm greeted by an ocean of coffee. It's just everywhere. It's everywhere. All over the countertop. It's all over the floor. It's drifting under the refrigerator. It's everywhere. I, in my infinite wisdom, was apparently thinking about other things because I brewed the entire pot of coffee without placing the coffee pot on the burner. I just... Hey, who needs coffee pot? We'll just lick it up off the ground, people. I told Natalie about it. I'm like, I'm an idiot. (sighs) It's one of those stupid things. You ever do stuff like this? Something stupid. And you think, what's wrong with me? I'm a dumbass. (laughs) It's like when you walk around the house looking for your car keys and you're holding them in your hand. Where are my keys? I know I put my keys somewhere. I know it. What did I do with my keys? Look down, I'm holding them. Pull that one a while back. Now, it has been argued that people who do this do so because they are thinking about other, hopefully more important things, right? Those resources up here, the gray matter, the uh, computer inside your skull is busy processing other things. And so, well, of course, some stuff's going to slip through the cracks, you know, like putting a coffee pot under a steady stream of java. Oh, of course, it's perfectly natural. It's dumb stuff. Yesterday, I, I kid you not, I will get to the meat of the show, but I'm just venting. We're friends, and sometimes I treat you like my bartender. I'm just letting it out. We got a new dog. I don't know if you've heard the story of Henry. I've got a video on the YouTube channel called Saving Number 90 that will hopefully move you. It's brought a lot of people to happy tears, but it's about a dog that we recently rescued. It was part of a puppy mill in northeastern Oklahoma. It had 103 dogs in a single mobile home. Just horrible conditions. Neglected, abused, covered in parasites. Just a horrible situation. And then we went and picked out this little three and a half pound skin and bone Yorkie Chihuahua mix. Just, this thing was just beaten up. Rib cage, just 
you could you could see its bone structure through this thin layer of skin, obviously malnourished and starved and abused. I mean, just terrible. And around his collar, he had a number. He was given a number by the Humane Society of the 103. He was number 90. So we took him home and he has become one of the joys of our life. One of the great joys of our life. This little rat dog has been. And he, of course, has given the current rat dog a companion. Yesterday, I'm walking around the house. Where's Henry at? Anyone seen Henry? Where's he at? Hey, baby, you seen Henry? Oh, no, did he slip out whenever... When you walked in the door, did he slip into the garage? You know, we've got that shelter out there. I think the shelter door is closed. Wait a minute. He didn't... Was the garage door open? I hope he's not in the front yard. I mean, he's got the chip, but he doesn't have a collar on it with his tag on it. Oh, my God, what if he's walking around the neighborhood? We'll never see him again. Right? I work myself up into a lather. I'm in the front lawn walking around. Henry! Henry! I'm looking in neighbors' lawns. I'm looking in shrubs. I'm looking everywhere. And then it occurs to me, I just put him on back 15 minutes ago. Hey, want to go outside? Oh, great. Popped him out there, closed the door. Totally zoned. I'm I'm canvassing the neighborhood, and my dog is just sitting at the back door going, Any time now, pal. Don't worry about little old me. Now, I just came from a shelter from a puppy mill. Yeah, just neglect me and sit me out back. I've been pulling this kind of stuff. What causes that? What drives it? Maybe I have not evolved. Maybe that's my problem. Tonight's show, of course, is about evolution. We will get into it here with my special guest in just a second. A reminder that tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Imagine No Religion which is a conference coming up here in just a few weeks. In Kamloops, British Columbia, Imagine No Religion 4 is happening May 16th through the 18th in Kamloops, British Columbia. And they've got an awesome lineup. Dr. Eugene Scott's going to be there. Dan Barker, Jerry Coyne, just had him on the radio. Jerry DeWitt, Chris DiCarlo. Annie Laurie Gaylor, Hammond's going to be there. Dr. Carolyn Porco, who, by the way, I just secured for an upcoming radio show. I think we're going to go in late June. Daryl Ray's going to be. It's just going to be all. I'm going to be out there giving a presentation. It's going to be a ball. And they're showing the unbelievers the film. Lawrence Krauss himself will be there for Q&A after the presentation of the movie. What an awesome weekend. If you want to find out more about it, there are still tickets left. You can go to imagineknoreligion.ca. That's imagineknoreligion.ca. I have two very special guests tonight. Both of them come from Christianity. Both of these gentlemen now speak about Christianity from the perspective of the skeptic, looking at scripture and doctrine with genuine curiosity that is unrestrained by the command of automatic acceptance, which is dictated by fundamentalists and fundamental churches. Ed Swominen is an ex-fundamentalist, a former engineer and inventor, and he's translated his success into an opportunity to do what he's genuinely passionate about, to promote rationality and free thought out there in this world. Dr. Robert Price, professor of biblical criticism at the Center for Inquiry. He's an author. His books include Beyond Born Again and Deconstructing Jesus. And of course, he is host of the Bible Geek podcast. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's a pleasure. Great to be on. Tell me about this book, it's approaching evolution, what, from more of a philosophical angle? I mean, is it the science of evolution, or are you taking a different tack with it? Give me kind of what your angle is. I'll start with you, Ed. What's the story? Well, we basically accept that, um, we assume that the reader accepts the reality of evolution. We devote some attention to the science, and really it's more of a sharing the fascination with the amazing facets of the science and how overwhelming the evidence is. But there are plenty of experts in the field. Uh, You had Dr. Coyne on here, greatly admire him as one of those experts. And they really lay out why evolution is true, as the name of his book, of course. And we do talk about that somewhat, but really it's, you know, we're accepting that that's the reality. But now let's look and see if there's any way to make that compatible with Christian theology. And that's where I was when the idea for the book came along as I was wrestling with that. Okay, evolution is real, 
my church doesn't think so, but is there a way to reconcile those two things? And the more we looked and just kept looking and looking, there are just so many issues that make them utterly incompatible. So that's really what the book is about, is all those theological problems with the reality of evolution. Was the question of evolution part of your ticket out? Was that one of the things that just wouldn't go away and it actually led to your deconversion? Yeah, absolutely. It was what opened the door. I was perfectly happy in my fundamentalist version of Christianity. We were the only true church, and I was very fortunate to be selected as, you know, the 0.002% of the world's population that was, in fact, uh, the children of God. And I had my 11 kids. Uh, Contraception was one of the things you're just not supposed to do. And, you know, I'm in my 40s, and, and life's good. And why would I be looking in that direction? But when I was doing some engineering work, I came along this this technique that uh, looked pretty fascinating, which was for evolving solutions to engineering problems by simulating whatever the widget is that you're trying to design and actually letting widgets evolve through a process of simulated natural selection <laughs> mutation, um, letting the most fit widgets mate, literally mate and produce more widgets and generations would go on. And I watched this on my computer and I watched these things actually work. And it really, I'm thinking, you're thinking, well, wait a minute now, this is really working. I'm, I'm seeing this process actually happening on my computer screen. Uh, it'd be kind of ludicrous to deny that there's something to this. And well, maybe I could just you know, investigate this a little bit. Maybe I wouldn't be quite so uh, sinful to to investigate. After all, this is for my engineering work. You know, that, that that's sort of a legitimate reason to look into this. So I wound up going down to the bookstore, and it was kind of funny. I'm I'm sitting here peeking glimpses at natural science books and Darwin books while looking over my shoulder to make sure no one from church is actually is actually <laughs> watching. Yeah. But there's a good reason why they don't want you looking at Darwin, and that's what we found out, is there's a lot of problems there. Dr. Price, I know that you guys collaborated together on the book Evolving Out of Eden. With your background, was it a fundamentalist background that you came from? Was it young earth creation and Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and all of that? It was, but that was pretty far in the background. While I was reconsidering things around 1977 and had decided I, that evangelical Christianity wasn't for me, I, I had been in it for about 12 years, um, I uh, didn't just automatically uh, switch from creationism. I, I had already kind of juggled uh, theistic evolution and so on. It wasn't a huge issue for me. But then uh, once I uh, realized the whole biblical authority thing just didn't work and was incoherent, I, I felt free to re-examine all kinds of things, and I decided to look into evolution. And I remembered criticisms leveled by creationists, and I thought, well, this really is a different issue. I mean, fundamentalism and the Bible aside, it could well be that uh, there's room for skepticism about this. Let me see if I can read some of the, the major theorists and see why, uh, if evolution seems to be um, viable and compelling. I mean, I, I didn't really know what the alternative might be. I had a kind of Socratic humility about it. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, the more I read, uh, a lot of people, Ashley Montague uh, and uh, oh, uh, Theodore Dobjansky, oh boy, speaking of tongues <laughs> here, uh, and uh, Jacques Monod and, and various other ones, I realized, yeah, this, uh, this is the way to go. And I, I would have a question about this or that, and sure enough, I'd continue reading and find out the answer to it. And so I figured, oh, okay, I guess that is true. But it, it wasn't the central thing for me at all, and I didn't beg any question about it when I became uh, disappointed with the notion of biblical authority. And even that was a gradual process about uh, other matters, uh, historical reliability in the Bible, contradictions and the impossibility of resolving them and so on. Uh, but so it was just more of a mind game that got more and more fascinating. But once I left evangelicalism, I decided to do a systematic 
sympathetic study of other varieties of theology, which I had always heard undersold. We were in the, the books I read and so on. Uh, from a theological standpoint, the evangelical theologians would say, well, of course, uh, both Montilic, Schleiermacher, these guys are all wrong for this and that reason. Implicitly, like, you needn't bother with those. We've, we've already shown you why it's, it's nonsense. Well, I went back and read uh, these people. I read a huge uh, number of uh, more liberal and neo-Orthodox and Catholic and other theologians and realized I'd been sold a bill of goods and uh, that a whole new world was opening up. But eventually, some of these theologies like process theology, which became very important even among evangelical theistic evolutionists, seemed to me unconvincing. And I mean, a lot of it was unconvincing, though it was fascinating. And I just came to believe, especially reading the many, many books, uh, Ed, and I read about theological attempts to assimilate evolution that there was just no way to do it. And whereas once uh, you had militant Christians, and still do, creationists, trying to show that science makes no sense without God, the people like Francis Collins had turned a corner and were now arguing, well, wait a minute, maybe there's still a, a little rat hole for God to hide in. Maybe science has not completely shown God to be a fifth wheel uh, that is not needed to to explain anything. And, and this was a major, major shift. And uh, it just became, even that became um, so contrived that it was not really much better than young earth creationism. And so I, I'm one reason I'm proud of this book we did is that it engages biblical and theological issues that I at least have never read dealt with in any of the books on the Bible and evolution. So I think we came up with a pretty uh, unusual product. When I was in the church, and this is common in many churches still today, people are sort of program to see evolution as wrong. We don't know anything about it, but we know it's false. It doesn't fit yeah. into the Bible puzzle. It's not just a disagreement, though. There's a fear culture at work. Evolution. This is the doctrine of Darwin. This is Satan infecting all of science. There seems to be a fear mechanism at play. Have you witnessed that, either of you? You want to speak to that? Yes, absolutely. There is, and, and with good reason. I think that there's a fear of what is just dimly understood on the surface. People have a, a, a gnawing notion that, well, if the Bible is wrong about this, then it, I mean, what else is it wrong about? I've heard those very words. The other issue that people sort of that gnaws at them is, well, you know, we hear about God bringing down a Savior. What's the Savior for? The Savior is there to save us from our sins. Well, what sins are those? And Protestant theology comes back to Adam and Eve, you know, the original sin. Well, what, what do you do with original sin if there was no original sinner? And there's this nagging feeling that maybe we shouldn't be looking into this. I, I remember when I was, uh, one of my friends in the church was asking me, well, what are you doing nowadays? And I says, oh, I'm, I'm evolving solutions to these engineering problems. It's pretty interesting stuff. And he looked at me and says, well, uh, that doesn't seem right. You know, he was kind of furrowed brow and kind of concerned for the state of my soul. Well, I'm, I'm doing engineering work, but the whole idea that evolution would be part of it was just uh, a little troubling for him. And, and that's what we found out as we read more and more is, you know what, there's really good reasons. And, and some of these reasons are beyond what, uh, what these people even realize. Psalm 139 tells us, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. Evolution to the believer can threaten his or her specialness, right? I am no longer a created being. My father is no longer a divine king. I am no longer going to receive a mansion and eternal reward. Evolution to them is sort of, in a way, a threat to how special they believe that they are. It's really tragic because if you look at the panorama posited by evolution and traced through the fossil records and all this stuff, it becomes absolutely astonishing that there need have been no guiding hand and that all this happened. And the fact that it did just happen is not a mystery. The whole thing works out so marvelously well and led to us uh, with Homo sapiens sapiens 
sapiens with the minds to figure all of this out, I think that it's uh, it's actually degrading to stoop to the superstition that we're really all just Pinocchios created by Geppetto, because that really, uh, in a sense, makes it all mundane. Oh, oh, that's what happened? Oh, okay, big deal. It's like uh, if a robot became self-aware and said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and found out, oh, I was just screwed together by this guy. I guess I'm really just his toy. Whereas if you uh, hear you are almost self-created, it, it's much more astonishing. But I think Ed is right that people fear this because if the Bible is wrong about this, then who knows what else it's wrong about. Perhaps the Bible is just human faith and speculation, and it seems to me it certainly is. Well, wait a minute, that's not good enough. Those things don't produce definitive answers, and I've got to know what happens after death, etc. Well, I don't think you do, but people are afraid and think they do. And so that, I think, is really the uh, bite uh, of this. They want certainty about certainty certain existential issues, and they're cheating to get it. And we see the uh, the human-centeredness in, in really all of these writings. I mean, it's not just creationists that have this idea of, of humans being special and unique. Even someone like Kenneth Miller, who's really a, a complete evolutionist, he, you know, he's, his science is impeccable. He's a scientist and teaches, does a great job of, of teaching evolution. But yet, even there, he can't help but refer to God's creatures. And there's really no other relationship that you can have with Christianity and, and God. You know, man is God's special creation. But the problem is, you have this afterthought that just came along very, very late in the game with all kinds of jury-rigged mechanisms in there and leftovers and, and evidence of our common ancestry. And, and here we are you know, God's special creation. Well, did he decide that we were special at some point? Did he say this is designated as, you know, going to be my my special relationship and not the previous version that's now extinct? So there's a lot of problems with that too. But like Bob says, there is also a, you look at it and it's mind blowing to see that really all this happened and came together. And here I am, yes, accidental, but no less miraculous for it. Talking here with Ed Swomanen and Robert M. Price, co-authors of the book Evolving Out of Eden, Christian Responses to Evolution. It's a chapter in the book called Jesus Christ, Super Chimp. You want to elaborate? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about here? Well, our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, is uh, the Christian Savior, is himself at least half a chimpanzee's cousin, right? He's a... Uh, He's evolved, certainly the Mary part was evolved from the previous hominids. And here we have Mary, who has all these evolved traits that we do that are supposedly the reason for our, our miserable state. You know, uh, Christians keep talking about how we're wretched and sin corrupt, and we have all these tendencies toward uh, lust and, and anger and all those things. Well, those turn out to be evolved traits that are adaptive and keep us, for the most part, adaptive, certainly were. And here we are, well, well Mary, at least the XX part of that, chromosome, you know, was was evolved. Well, guess what? You have the divinely produced part of that for the incarnation comes along. It's not going to work if it doesn't match up with the, the mother's part. Uh, you know, you can't have the incompatible chromosomes result in, a, in another organism. And so guess what? The divine part of that chromosome, uh, uh, genome actually, 42 chromosomes, that has to be defective by design in order to match up. It's got to have all the same, you know, miserable traits, even though it's supposedly the divine part. And so we have Jesus here who, contrary to Christian theology, he's not the perfect sinless man. He couldn't be because he's got to have all of these traits that Christian theology points the finger at us and says we are at fault for having these traits. Yeah, this is not uh, impossible for 
some theologians to deal with. Uh, Edward Irving, back in, I think, the 19th century, who founded this interesting movement, the Catholic Apostolic Church, he got into big trouble for... I mean, the movement was sort of uh, Victorian Pentecostalism before Pentecostalism, a really fascinating group. But uh, he got into some hot water by saying that Jesus had a fallen human nature. And then decades later, Karl Barth, uh, the same thing. He said that Jesus didn't sin. He wasn't a sinner, but he had a fallen human nature, or it's not an incarnation. So you could say that, uh, but most people uh, avoid that like the plague. They, Of course, this gets into an old legitimate theological issue. Did Jesus not sin, though he could have, as it, I think it implies in the epistle of the Hebrews, or did he not sin because he couldn't? Uh, and uh, this uh, implies, well, he could have, but he didn't. And there are, but it is also getting to this interesting question of docetism, the ancient so-called heresy that Jesus merely seemed to be fully human. Well, if you want to imply that, uh, though I don't know that any theologians have thought this out this far, perhaps they am and I'm just ignorant, but if you want to say that God made Jesus appear to have evolved through the, the nature red and tooth and claw and the uh, uh, savage cave man and so forth, but he didn't. Then you're dealing with docetism in a subtle form. He's not really incarnated as a true human being after all. And we found there were several big uh, problems that just didn't seem to have been dealt with. There another one, Ed mentioned what becomes of original sin? Like, why do you even need that? Well, you could just go with Judaism and uh, I'd say the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where it seems to imply God forgives those who repent, and that's that. But if you say, well, he could always have done that, uh, why did uh, Jesus die as a sacrifice? What did that add to it? Well, there must have been something even worse than individual sin, some fundamental taint, and, and uh, it took the radical surgery of the cross to deal with that. And so if you don't have a fundamental deforming of human nature through a fall, it's hard to explain anymore what the point was of the crucifixion. And again, these people, uh, the Peter Enns and uh, Dennis Lamoureux and other um, evangelicals, so-called, uh, who say, well, there wasn't any Adam, let's face it, but that doesn't mean that our doctrines change. Oh, I, I beg to differ. Uh, it really matters if uh, you think there was no fall, then what are we being saved from? Being human? Is, is that the point? Is being a sinner the same thing as being human? Because then you're getting into a kind of a Gnostic theology that uh, human beings as material entities are inherently sinful, and uh, this just really gets messy theologically. I'll start with you, Dr. Price, on this. I want to digress for just a second. As we're talking about original sin, you know, you go to the book of Psalm 147, which says God has no limit to his understanding. His understanding has no limit. God is omniscient. There's nothing he does not know. He exists beyond time. And of course, we look at original sin. We look at God's plan, creating of Adam and Eve in the garden and the fall and the eventual supposed need to drown the planet, which didn't work, and then send his son to be tortured and executed, it stands to reason that an omniscient deity would have seen his plan fail before he ever began. Dr. Price, you want to speak to that? Yeah, the ancients who wrote these stories didn't have any problem depicting God as just a great divine inventor. He says, uh, once he sees how corrupt the human race has gotten, uh, he says, gee, I am sorry I ever made these people. It repenteth me that I made them. And so he decides to wipe them out. Well, obviously, he didn't foreknow it any more than he knew where uh, Adam and Eve were in Eden. Hey, where is everybody? I'm over here in the bush because I'm naked. <laughs> <laughs> like look, this this uh this, these writers, they didn't have the advantage of Thomas Aquinas and St. Anselm and Paul Tillich uh, to have said God is an absolute spirit without bounds. He exists outside of time. What are you talking about? They wouldn't have had any idea about that. And so uh, the problem is really trying to theologize ancient mythology, uh, because what we're talking about, the, the Christian God really uh, is not the way 
he's described in either testament of the Bible, and the foreknowledge is, is one of the biggies. Uh, it, it often does say, uh, it has God say, this is what I'm going to do, and no one can stop me. Well, yeah, that makes sense, because God is so powerful, no one is powerful enough to gainsay him. But that's different than saying he knows theoretically what's going to happen before it does, because it's all present to him, like St. Augustine said, nobody was thinking that way. And so the, the real poison uh, is to begin to um, inject philosophy into mythology, which everybody does ever since the ancient Stoics who allegorized the Iliad and the Odyssey because they realized the gods are depicted as imperfect. And if there is a god, God must be a, an abstract, rational principle. Well, you just jumped into a different universe there. And uh, creationists are still doing the same thing, uh, trying to mythologize science, They're trying to say, well, there's certain things we don't know. And so uh, let's just short circuit the process and say God did it. And God is just, uh, as always, the name for a question. As when, when Origen said, God only knows who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. Well, what he really means to say is, we don't know. No human being knows. But it becomes more than a figure of speech and turns into superstition. Ed Swelmanen, you want to jump in here and give us a perspective? Well, it, like Bob said, the the God that's being postulated by our theistic evolutionists is not the God who demonstrated his superiority by torturing a pile of damp vegetables. You know, he's a very different kind of a deity. He's hidden. He's, he's so hidden, in fact, this modern God, that he's completely indetectable. As you go down further and further and further into, for example, the DNA, and you keep looking, you just see more randomness and more natural naturalistic explanations, but you don't see any evidence of this deity that supposedly created everything, which, which raises a couple of questions. One is, like I said, is very different from what the Bible writers themselves envisioned. But number two is, why is he hiding himself so much and making himself so disprovable to modern science? You know, where is he at and why is he, uh, it's sort of like the fossils set in the hillsides to test our faith. Well, in this case, he's, he's putting all this evidence into the genome itself to make it look like there's actually nobody behind the tiller. Nobody's sitting there running the show. If I can paraphrase a buddy of mine, Matt Dillahunty, we were speaking about this very thing. And he said, you know, he questioned the divine plan that uh, God would create a hundred billion galaxies to place humans on a single rock in one tiny part of it and send most of them to hell. Doesn't seem like the act of an omnipotent, omniscient, benevolent deity. It just doesn't really wash when you look at it without your God glasses on. The ancients weren't faced with this problem because using naive observational science, and that's what it was, they just didn't have technology and instruments yet, they naturally thought that the heavenly bodies revolved around the earth and that the, the universe was small, the, uh, the stars were little ceiling lamps, and it made sense to them to figure that human beings were central in, in everything. But once you know what we know, to come up with any explanation as to why God would have made the vast universe, just as you were saying, Matt Delhunt, he said, you're bringing in a gigantic, bigger frame of reference that just makes nonsense of the original, which wasn't absurd, though false, in its original setting. And that's really kind of the the cameo of the whole thing. It, once you wind up the, with the, the peekaboo deity, uh, <laughs> that uh, why would God, Deus Abscunditis, why would he make himself impossible to discern? It, 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 what does it say in Romans that God's eternal power and deity are seen from the things he's made? Well, not anymore. I mean, naturally they thought so back then. They weren't stupid. What else were you going to think? But now it's clear you have to posit a God who is doing his best to hide out and that it's just such a transformation of the story. You, you might as well admit you just don't believe what traditional Christianity says. You're coming up with some sort of a new uh, species, uh, perhaps an incoherent one of faith. If I may quote from the book in the Peekaboo Deity chapter, it's well said, this devious designer has constructed our entire genome to look exactly as naturalistic evolution would have produced it without 
is tinkering. If I can paraphrase uh, Julia Sweeney, the universe operates exactly as it would as if there was no God. It seems rather conspicuous. If you guys have a few moments, I'd like to go to the switchboard and we'll field some calls. Would that be all right? Sure. That'd be great. You Area don't. code 607. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio Podcast. Who's this? Hey, it's uh, John from Upstate New York again. Thanks for calling. What's your question or comment? My question for the panel is very much related to the evolution debate, particularly about evolution in education. I just graduated a uh, master's class in education, and I had a lot of peers who got their master's degree in science education. And a lot of them were very, very nervous about, you know, going into the job market and we're very cognizant of certain school districts' attitudes towards teaching evolution or teaching creationism and we're very nervous about it. What would you say to my classmates? What would you say to my peers who are entering the job market now of science education and are very nervous about that? I would defer this one to Bob because here's a man who has paid the price for a principled stand about uh, intellectual matters. And I think, Bob, you could really address this. Well, you do have to decide where your obligation lies. It's best not to get into a position where your uh, livelihood and that of your family depends on uh, being dishonest and inconsistent. I have great compassion for pastors, for instance, who have rethought the thing too late, and now uh, they can't just have themselves and their family kicked out of the, the parsonage and try to find a, a new job. I mean, if they can, they do, but uh, if it's easier said than done. But if you're going to go into something like that or public school science teaching in an area where uh, evolution is evolution, then uh, you, you really have to take stock. Can you do this without perjuring yourself? If you want to pick and choose, and I, you know, we do on other grounds anyway, you might just try to clarify it to begin with, what is the school's stance on this? What can I get away with saying? And ultimately, the you know, this business teach the controversy. That might be a way out of this because I think it's effective to, for someone to say, whether it has to do with biblical criticism or science uh, as it relates to the, the Bible and God, to just say, look, this is why many are convinced of this, and I'm convinced of it, but then this is what opponents say, and I see these problems with it, and uh, just sort of leave it at that, and you kind of assume if someone is intelligent, they'll see what you're talking about and make up their own mind, but you're not in the position of seeming to propagate something that to their parents and perhaps the administration is a controversial notion. You can just say, look, I owe it to uh, the kids to tell them what most scientists think and why so they can make an informed decision. I, I knew a, a woman who was uh, gave tests to homeschoolers. We were homeschooling our daughters uh, uh, once uh, some years ago, and I took them to this woman's house for a test, and I noticed she had all these different books, and I said, well, it's obvious you take this very seriously. And so what do you do when evolution and science comes up? And she's a fundamentalist, and she said, well, I trust them to be intelligent, and I outline what evolution is and so on, and I gave her a lot of credit for that. That might be the way to go to say, uh, and there does seem to be overwhelming evidence. This is why people think this, because you have to consider who you're talking to. People who in Sunday school and church are told that this is false, and you, uh, you have to uh, make the case. You have to step back a few steps historically to communicate. Thank you, and thanks to you guys. I'm humming to myself, Jesus Christ, super chimp, through the rest of the evening. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, <laughs> take it easy. Dr. Price, you mentioned your daughters, which brings me back to uh, something Ed said at the top of the show. Did I hear 11 children, Ed? 11? 
11 children. We were fruitful and we multiplied. You know, <laughs> what causes that? Scientists determined how this happened, right? I mean, was it that strict well, that uh, no contraceptives? Oh, it's so a uh, hard line on contraception that one of the prominent pastors of the church praised a woman who died from childbirth for having accepted the teachings of the church and dying. And he praised her in a Mother's Day sermon that a bunch of women sat there and listened to. And then uh, not too long after that sermon, there was another big flap with a, a woman with some mental illness. And it was very unfortunate that, no, it's a very hard line stand. And it does relate somewhat to creationism because one of the reasons for it, besides the be fruitful and multiply, you know, thing is you don't want to interfere with God's ongoing creation work. So. Is some of that a desire to populate the earth with believers, right? We're replicating now. We're going to have so many kids, and they're all going to be Christians that eventually will just take over the world. I mean, there, there's some churches that actually have these types of doctrines. Was that present in yours? There are in the, in the Quiverful movement, yeah. But in this particular group, no. I don't think that's a factor at all. It's just simple. It's a very naive, childish, and they would say childlike faith. Uh, trying to adhere to the Bible, and this yeah. is one of the areas. Well, I didn't mean to digress too much there, but I was just thinking, 11 kids, geez, who bought the groceries, man? That's crazy. <laughs> Where do you put them <laughs> yeah. all, for Pete's sake? I had a message in from Robert. He asked this question. What would your guest say to the common argument of theists that evolutionary processes are quintessentially amoral? The demands of the DNA molecule has no need for morality but merely the raw fuel of resources intersecting with the opportunity for further replication. We're speaking about ethics and morality. In the evolutionary model, does it make sense? Do you gentlemen want to speak to that? Oh, absolutely it makes sense because those DNA molecules code for human beings, and those human beings participate in societies that produce more human beings. And we want to live in societies where, for example, our spouses aren't raped, where our kids aren't killed or sold off into slavery. We want those things, and they ultimately are to the good of this organism that we are. So, yeah, just like the DNA chemicals don't code for my nose or my eye, you know, they code for those things, but they don't describe them. You can't look at those things and say, that looks like a nose. Um, in fact, a lot of those characteristics spread over many different features. You'll have some snippet of DNA that'll code for several different things, and they sort of interact together like a hologram. But ultimately, the bottom line is that we want to be moral people just because that's the way we want to live. I know that many apologists and even scientists like Francis Collins hold to the objective moral standard argument. You wouldn't know rape is wrong unless the standard had already been established. Therefore, there must be an establisher, some sort of a supreme being up there. Dr. Price? Yeah, that's just another, uh, like, why does it rain? Well, I guess because Zeus turned on the faucet. That is no explanation. In fact, every time God is brought into this, it's a way of saying, uh, hey, I've got uh, an answer to puzzle X. The answer is Y or Z. Uh, look, you just answer in one enigma, quote unquote, answering with a bigger one. That's no explanation. Plus, you don't need absolute moral standards. It's it's all pragmatism. The reason that all societies all over the world have a, an agreement on the basics is, as Aristotle and Aquinas readily admitted, it's because the human animal is the same all over, and there are certain things that are going to facilitate, as Ed said, the kind of life most people want to live. Uh, there are anomalous nuts out there, but that's why we have laws and, and prisons and so forth. They have to deal with those for the good of everybody else. And in terms of evolution, yeah, there is no morality in natural selection, but there is once you get intelligent enough to have cultural selection kick in. We get to the point where we can start calling the shots. One example I like to use is like my eyesight is miserable without glasses. Well, as long as we make glasses and lenses and eye surgery, we have determined that we want individuals to be safe. Without my glasses, I could just get run over the street easily. Well, we don't want that to happen, so we decide, 
you know, if we did let uh, oafs like Price get run down in the street, eventually we would evolve perfect sight for everybody. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't really want – I'm willing to make the sacrifice to uh, invent glasses for everybody. Yeah, well, we're assuring people will still be nearsighted, but uh, I guess we're going to choose the value of individuals. And that's cultural selection. Well, the same thing here. The uh, morality is just the, the kind of social – contract that we all, I mean, can you prove it is ultimately right in some deontological sense? No, but does it have to be? I mean, is there really any doubt that you uh, don't want rape, theft, murder, etc. to take place? There are a lot of people that don't see that, but then you, you have to take measures to protect the common good. My guest tonight, Ed Swominen and Robert M. Price, co-authors of the book Evolving Out of Eden. I may be trying to be too clever here, but are you using Eden as kind of a metaphor for the cocoon that believers live in? Like we need to break past the boundaries to explore the rest of the real world. Is that too much of a stretch? Am I being too clever there? <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, it's the yeah. innocence, the innocent faith fairyland there. There's no meat, tough meat to chew on. It's all just nice, mushy fruit, and you know, you just pick them off the trees, and there's no, there's no troubles. Well, it turns out actually there's quite a bit of issues once you step outside that gate. But unfortunately, the angel has said, "Get out of here," and and has set forth a flaming sword, and you're on your own. You've got to start thinking for yourselves. It's time to put away childish things. That type of thinking, perhaps. Mm-hmm. When you subtitled the book Christian Responses to Evolution, what are we talking about? I mean, are you taking it argument by argument? Are you going through the claims of Scripture? Are you debunking creationism and building an evolution education platform on top of that? I mean, give me the angle of the book here. What are you trying to do? The debunking creationism is a fairly small part of it. We, like, we do talk about that, and we do talk about... It comes up a few times where we observe that people really are regressing to a form of creationism almost entirely throughout the spectrum of going from just the literal creationists to the very sophisticated theologians that say, well, of course evolution is true, but God was behind it. There's always this little regression back to a form of creationism, but really it's going down the spectrum of these arguments against why evolution is a problem. And so it's the Christian responses in this fairly small portion of Christianity that accepts evolution but thinks there really isn't an issue. Yeah, that's the group that is almost never dealt with, though Jerry Coyne does a fine job of it. Uh, but we deal with, uh, there's a big chunk uh, dealing with what the Bible actually says about creation and the shape of the world and the relation of the heavenly bodies and all that, because the Bible says various things, or at least three different versions of creation, one of them having God create the world from the carcass of a dragon he killed, uh, <laughs> Leviathan, uh, Tiamat, like the Hydra that Hercules killed, and uh, then there are the more familiar ones, though so that one pops up in Isaiah, Job, the Psalms, etc. It was a common nature. Near Eastern myth. So there are various ones that people just don't even know about. Then there's the issue of the sun orbiting the earth in the Bible. You, you can't easily get away from that. The fact that the earth is depicted as being flat, the ancients weren't stupid. This was the best they could do with observational science, natural philosophy. But now, uh, they, the fundamentalists don't like evolution, but even they are so far down the line in science that it doesn't even occur to most of them to think that the Earth is flat or that the sun orbits the Earth. There are a few holdouts, but eventually I think uh, you'll – well, what you're beginning to see is uh, an embrace of evolution by more and more evangelicals, but they don't think it through, I believe, to see where there really still is a gross incompatibility. And the liberal types process theologians, Teilhard D. Chardin, John Howden, and these other guys, they uh, are really making their view into a reductio ad absurdum. They don't seem to realize it, but they're showing why the last vestige of theology is even inconsistent with this. Uh, so we're trying to show the Bible, what it says much more than, uh, than you'd think. Like Albert Schweitzer said about the historical Jesus, are you sure you want to find out what the evidence says because you're not going to like the result? And then we deal with the theology of it. Is it possible to uh, have some still recognition? 
recognizable as theology if you take evolution seriously. And I mean, I'm no religion hater. I don't, uh, you know, hope and believe there's no God. I'm, I'm not persuaded that there is, but I take theological arguments very seriously. But I just regret to say it just nobody's come up with any way of dealing with this. And then in the year 2014, you see... The Institute for Creation Research, Answers in Genesis. If you go to Creation Ministries International, on their website it says this, and I quote, By definition, no apparent perceived or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. Essentially, they're taking a Bible and using it as a tool to swat away scientific discovery. Just as uh, Muslim apologists do, the Quran says this, so to hell with science. Once you look at this, it's like a mirror of Christian fundamentalism. Don't you see where you're headed with this kind of, quote, thinking, unquote? There's a line in the book that probably relates, it, it relates to this also. It's it says it's like getting all the answers wrong, but still getting an A on the exam. Which happens all the time, of course, in our culture, which may have something to do with this. Area code 252. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Darren from Tucson, Arizona. Darren, thanks so much for calling. You're on the air with Dr. Robert M. Price and Ed Swoman. And what do you have for us tonight? Well, thanks for taking my call, Seth. I, uh, I'm an atheist married to a fundamentalist Christian. She's a young earth creationist. We have two children together, so the topic of evolution comes up sometimes. For example, when my son says, Mama, Papa, how did snakes lose their legs? Uh, it comes up pretty often, and so we have to uh, kind of hash it out. And uh, I've tried to describe to her the realities of evolution. I've told her about human genome number two. I've shown her the transitional fossils of, of humans, of fish to lizards, and she really won't take to it. I'm wondering if you guys have any advice for me on how to handle this situation tactfully. And you were in this situation. Yeah, I mean, I did not want evolution to be true. And because I was perfectly happy in my Christianity. It's a, you know, it's the whole social life I was in. There were so many reasons to say it was wrong, to say it was false. And in fact, my first readings on the subject, along with dabbling with Darwin a little bit, was trying to see what the other side had to say, you know, hoping that, okay, my team, you know, yay team, let's see if we can, we, we can score a run here. And watching, you know, Seth, you've had your Christopher Hitchens debate moment that was pivotal in your deconversion. Um, watching those debates with creationists, I would just cringe because, oh, come on, you know, is it really this intellectually vacuous on my side? Well, it turns out, yes, it was. And the thing is, there's so much motivation to not change your mind. With your daughter, though, she's still young, and she doesn't have quite as much vested in this, except maybe the approval of her mother. So it, it, seemed, it would seem like there would be more chance for uh, you know, a balanced presentation of things to take root there before the damage is done. I think also that... Uh you don't want this to be an issue with you and your wife because it would drive a wedge between you and, and what your life is based on is your love for one another and the many things you appreciate about one another. Well, you don't have to agree on everything. You can kind of agree to disagree because, of course, you know what difference does it really make to you if she's wrong about evolution? That's not what you're, you're saying is the problem, I gather. But what about the kids? And there, I would say it, it'd be worth trying to uh, say, look, uh, our our children will need to know what this means, uh, the, just to uh, you know to be educated. Uh, let's not catechize them. I mean, why don't we say, you know, this is what mommy believes, and this is what what daddy thinks, and here's why. And of course, it's up to you. You need to think about this. You don't want to program them into either uh, view because that wouldn't get them anywhere if they don't know why one ought to believe one or the other. And uh, I'd see if she would agree to that. You're not going to tell him, oh, yeah, you got to accept Darwin as your personal savior or something. <laughs> you know, here's why I think what I think. Uh, mommy can explain why she thinks what she thinks. But, you know, we get along because uh, these opinions, they're interesting, but uh, they're not, uh, we don't accept or reject one another because of them. That answer your question? It does. It does. It's a minefield to try to navigate, and I was uh, looking to see if I had some. You had some advice on how to navigate it. It's difficult, definitely. I appreciate your time, though. Very kind. Thanks for calling the show. Much appreciated, my friend. 
Thank you, Seth. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye. Uh -huh. A couple more real fast. Area code 971. Thank you for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is David. Uh, this is awesome. Glad to be able to talk to you. Um, I come out of an interesting background, son of a minister, Episcopal priest, and uh, raised in a very open-minded situation. So uh, from the get-go, I was raised as a, uh, a believer, supporter of science. And I eventually ended up teaching. And uh, this, just this year, I've come out as, as finally rejecting the concept of God and uh, as an explanation. But I, I encountered a lot of this because I taught chemistry and biology. And uh, we would, uh, a good friend of mine and I would, would approach this by saying, you know, I was thinking about the caller just before this, we would approach it in a four-point way because we encountered in a conservative environment a lot of children coming up saying, I don't accept this. And uh, we would just lay out four points of evolution without ever mentioning the word evolution. Inheritance through DNA or through genes, populations exploiting their resources over population, and then population crashing, giving the selection. And when you set all four of those out like that, people don't usually have a problem with any one of those. Hmm. And when you lay it out like that, they'll admit to each of those four. And then when you look at them and go, well, that's natural selection, the principle of evolution. And it's kind of fun to watch the look on their face. Well, I can relate to the describing these four characteristics and then, then only then using these loaded terms. Because it, for a long time, the words Darwin and evolution were almost like curse words to me. It was, it was, when you say the words, the connotation was so negative that it was like, well, the brain just shuts off. I still remember years ago when we checked out this uh, VHS video from the library and it showed these clams making their way around the water. And there's David Attenborough uh, narrating how these things evolved. And everything just seemed so fascinating and, and made so much sense. And then he said that word evolved, and it was like a little gate shut off in my mind. Um, I didn't want to hear anymore. So you have to work around the back end of, of it and just show the amazing, amazing, I hate to use the word, but it really does apply miracle of naturalistic evolution and how we got here. And when you appreciate those things and how simple it really is, then let the words come, you know, after that. It's just, you think about it, and I'll digress just for a second, but things are here because they're here. They evolved, you know, the natural selection and genetic drift resulted in what we are because we did well. Those ancestors did well and then reproduced. And it really comes down to something as simple as that. I think also the approach you've taken is good because... As Ed says, it's a loaded word, evolution, and it's loaded with misconceptions. People have weird ideas about what evolution is, so ridiculous that naturally it seems stupid to them. So if you could avoid the word and just say, look, here's, here's what scientists think happened, call it whatever you want, that's a better way of doing it to get around their misconceptions. David, thank you very much for the call, my friend. Greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. It's great talking about it. We do hear a lot of that type of stuff, a, not just an oversimplification, but a complete misunderstanding. My grandfather wasn't a monkey. If we came from monkeys, mm. why are there still monkeys? Mm. And one of my favorites, if you believe in evolution, you are automatically an atheist. Social Darwinism, eugenics, all of these things are tossed out in the discussion about what evolution is and isn't. And you're right. I mean, there's a huge sort of a canyon of misconception that people fall into every single day. Somewhat of a background statement to that, though, is when you say if you're an evolution, if you believe in evolution, you are an atheist. In a roundabout way, after 300 some odd pages of, of this book, we are kind of, Bob and I, have been forced into that conclusion that, you know, if you take evolution for its full implications, for its full scientific implications, and you look at the whole picture of how you know, you've got the, the random mutations and you've got genetic drift and natural selection all working here in this, in this laboratory that's running itself with all these experiments, and the discarded experiments wind up at most as fossils and the successful ones wind up as us, and it's entirely naturalistic, you kind of are forced into this conclusion that you mm. really have to be atheist, and I didn't want that conclusion. 
but here I am. Well, unless you're doing the guided evolution thing. I mean, the Catholic Church holds to evolution to a degree. And that's probably a retreat position, right? They could no longer stand by the Genesis account. They could no longer fly in the face of hard scientific data. So they said, all right, fine. We now hold to or support guided evolution. Is that kind of a way of trying to evolve? Religions are evolving to try to stay relevant? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, absolutely. And there's a subheading in one of our chapters called Shoveling After the Parade. So that gives you some idea about our discussion of that particular topic. It's, it's backwards. You're trying to, the science has marched on and it's, it's shown all this stuff. And now you have these sophisticated theologians that are with their shovels running behind the horses trying desperately to, to make sense of it all. Dr. Price? Yeah, you can sort of believe there's a God if you don't really mean anything by it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do one more. Area code 207. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Kenneth from Thorndike, Maine. Kenneth, thanks for calling the show tonight. What do you have for us this evening? Well, I've been really impressed by your podcast. It's been quite a help to me. I, I come from an extremely fundamentalist background, and I uh, was, well, I was Pentecostal to start with, and then I joined into the Mennonites and finally into the Old Order Amish until mm. I came out about a year and a half ago as an atheist. I was sort of flushed out. I was trying to be in the closet, but it didn't work. So uh, from my standpoint on this subject, uh, to me it was the last straw. When I began to realize that evolution actually was a fact, that's when everything took a tumble for me. I had an atheist friend out in Missouri that I was trying to convince that there was a God, and my last, uh, my last stronghold was that everything that we see points to an intelligent creator, intelligent designer. Of course, he asked me the classic question, well, then, who designed the designer? And I was totally floored. I, I had never thought of it that way. Hmm. And that was, that was my last straw. And so, for me, for my background... From being a fundamentalist believer, a, what I call myself, I was a fundamentalist of the fundamentalist. I can't relate to people who say that they can be a Christian and believe fully in evolution because it begins to question and unravel the entire foundation of our belief in a creator God. There was, in the process of working on this book, I wound up having to discard my last vestiges of theism. I started the project as a very troubled Christian and ended as, well, I hate to use the word because it, it had, again, it's one of those connotation words, atheism. But as I was looking into this, parts of it just kept fading away from me. And one of those that really was the straw, camel's back, was when we talked about, when we wrote about quantum mechanics and how that's supposedly where God, uh, in this uh, hidden God, tinkers with the course of history and, and causes what he wants to evolve. And did the thought experiment, writing it out, how, okay, how would this hidden God actually influence evolution? Let's say you've got, you know, this guy, this pre-hominid who's standing around and, and God wants people to be able to talk. And so he's going to make a mutation in the Fox P2 gene so that speech will eventually evolve. And the guy's standing around, well, let's have this uranium atom emit a particle and have it aim into the testicles of this Homo erectus as he's standing there. He's got to have the particle leave the rock, and it's got to aim in the right direction to hit the exact right one of these tubules in the guy's testes to cause a mutation in the sperm cell so that when he gets a gleam in his eye that night, then the, the mutation winds up being carried along or Either that or he's got to use a shotgun approach where all kinds of mutations go along. So these slouching Romeos wandering around, they eventually get this mutation. And it just really seems so ridiculous when I sat and thought about it that, first of all, he's going through all this trouble to hide himself. But then the way he's doing it is so absurd. You just can't get there from here. And that's when I finally decided, well, I'm not going to use the word. I just don't like the word. But I just can't see how there could possibly be a God behind any of this. And you have to ask, why would God have taken this approach? Well, because he wanted to make it easier for sophisticated okay. apologists. That's the only reason. I, I personally think that the reason why the fundamental churches flatly reject evolution is because they see that when you start down that path, it only, only takes you in, in one to one position or, or to one place. And they wisely yeah. 
then shut down their minds because they don't want to go there. It's like one Amish brother told me one time that he's not going to take that path. He's not going to um, let himself think that way. And, and the reason was because he had a lot at stake. I mean, he had his wife and children and family. And like for myself, I've lost practically everything. My wife has left me. My oh, children yeah. are gone. And uh, it's all because that I have uh, come to realize that it's, it's built, you know, the Bible teachings are based on myth. And it's been very difficult. Well, I think what's difficult for some families to understand, too, is that you didn't choose this. It's not like you woke up one day and decided you didn't buy it anymore. You simply decided to look at it honestly without the filters, and you couldn't help. I mean, under the surface, you can profess anything, but what you genuinely believe, well, that's not really a choice. The current state that the four of us are in right now is as much a pro- an inevitable process of our own evo- evolutions as our bodies are. We couldn't help it. It, it. This is what had to happen. My friend, I am very sorry to hear about your family, but I will say, and I hope this doesn't come off as sort of trite or cliche, but you do have family and you do have community. There are many people who have lost loved ones at least in their circle, they've been shunned in some capacity, who have found community and support and strength and all the things that we try to get from others, they found it in the free thought community, and not just necessarily atheist communities, but communities that support free thinking and genuine curiosity. Yeah. So I hope you can, yeah. if you haven't already, I hope you'll find kind of a connection in that capacity, my friend. Thank you very much. Yes. You know, if I could yes. just say one thing, I think you might benefit from considering that you have carried the cross of truth. This is discipleship in a true sense. That hasn't changed for not being a Christian or a theist. That's true. And, and you know, I, I have been accosted by different Amish, former Amish brethren, and they have asked me, well, how does it feel now that you're being shunned and, you know, uh, the things you're going through, as though that I would collapse and say, well, you know, I can't take it anymore, I'm coming back to the faith, but I just have to tell them that it's sort of a bittersweet experience. I'm thankful for the truth I've I've gained, although I have to pay a price for that. Yeah. Um, and the only way that I've been able to stay afloat is to apply myself to finding community, like the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Seth, I really appreciate your efforts. It's been I probably have listened to every podcast you've ever produced. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and it's been, it's been a, it's been a just a, a real learning experience. Just a real, uh, I just so much wish I could share them with my family, but of course they would refuse. But I recommend it to anyone. And also, I want to say that uh, my friend in Missouri, he pointed me when when we got into discussion about creationism, uh, and he realized that I was working from a flawed platform, and yet he also realized that I was beginning to open up, he encouraged me to watch the series by Arne Raw on the foundational faults of the creationism. When I watched those, that was pretty well the end of it. I just realized that there's no possible way that the creation story can be true. Well, thank you for the support and kind words about the show. By the way, if you hadn't heard Dr. Price's Bible Geek show, the guy has a... Savant level recall <laughs> of Bible history. It's just bizarre. I literally listen, Doctor Price. I listen to your show, and I I come away thinking I'm either smarter or I'm an idiot for having lots of the show. <laughs> well, you but could say I have an idiot savant grasp. Of it's a it's a really well, really good question, show. So, one question, if I may ask, Ed, uh, what background did you say you were from? It's called the Lestadian Lutheranism. Um, it, okay. It's a very exclusive group. I'd like to address you, caller, and, and really address Seth's audience generally. Okay. Uh, what an awesome group you guys are. I'm part of this audience. I've listened to every episode, too. And I was, you know, Seth was this voice on the other end of the headphones that was understanding what I was going through. But it wasn't just you, Seth. It was callers like the one we're talking to now and all these other people that call into the show and email and write. You guys are awesome, and I just feel this sense of kinship with all of the people listening here. And I've seen it firsthand when, Seth, when you posted a link to uh, an article about me as an ex-fundamentalist um, from Salon. Well, when that article was published in Salon, I, there were hundreds of comments, and there were these snarky comments from people about, you know, oh, he just didn't understand. He's still thinking as a, a fundamentalist. And even some atheists, you know, well, what took him so long? You know, kind of a slow learner, isn't he? But when you posted the, the comment, when you posted the article, 
the comments were all understanding. Yeah, I get it. Been there, done that. You know, it was just a different vibe. And it's such an honor to be speaking to your audience right now, knowing that you guys are all going through what I've gone through. Well, and that article is how we met. We actually hadn't interacted before that day, but it was a, a great, great story. And um, I'll include the link to that article in the description box of this show. My friend, I appreciate your call very, very much. And I will say I'm fascinated by the Amish. I, yeah. My education about the Amish has come, unfortunately, from Hollywood. <laughs> what I see yeah. that say it. Which isn't very accurate. Yeah, I, that's. I mean, I'm thinking about the Witness, the film. I'm thinking about those yeah. types of things. But one day we will cover this subject and the culture and community yeah. of of the Amish, and I may lean to you to participate in that discussion. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd be glad to help wherever I can. Don't leave out Al Yankovic's video of uh, Amish Paradise. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for the call very much. Gentlemen, put an exclamation point on the book for me. I will, of course, link to the book in the description box of this show, the website to find out more or to order. And I'll be shameless and say support this book. Consume this book. It is a genuinely helpful compilation of great examinations and rebuttals of the incorrect arguments about and against evolution. Evolvingoutofeden.com is the website, evolvingoutofeden.com. Gentlemen, any final words on the book and on Christian responses to evolution? Well, I would end it with the way the book ends, which is a quote from the Bible itself. And it's my, one of my favorite passages from the Bible. Um, it's the writer of Ecclesiastes. He says, you know, go your way, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God now accepts your works. You know, he says, this is your reward in life. There's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you're going. Enjoy the life that you've got right now. It, it may be the only one we've got, but it's, it's a pretty awesome life. And mm. we are such an amazing, you think about all the things that had to come together over billions, literally billions of the B years for us to get here. It's just an amazing thing to actually be alive and to be able to look back now and say, wow, I kind of understand what I am for the first time in history. We can actually look at ourselves and say, you know, I kind of get this. Dr. Price. What more can I say than to you he hath said? I think uh, that he sums it up well. Ed's that way. He just takes away all the good stuff, and what we're left with yeah, is just right. crumbs here. Again, I will link to the uh, book in the description box of this show, evolvingoutofeden.com. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, and a wonderful night to you both. Thank you. It was an honor. It was yeah. an honor. Thanks, Seth. Next Friday night, our show is about coming out atheist. It's one thing to reject a belief in God. It's another thing to say it out loud. And the ramifications for many are very serious. We'll take your calls and emails. Greta Christina will be stopping by to talk about her new book on the subject. It's next Tuesday night on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Take care. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com